50% or more of people in this country believe that their dog is a member of the family. Isn't that precious? <laughs> mm -hmm. It does a lot for the dog, but you have to think about what it does for the family. Right? And uh, dogs are wonderful. They often, there's a little country song, if there's a dog heaven, this one thing I know, old Shep's got a wonderful home. And there's plenty of room. And uh, personally, I think that heaven is going to be much better than we could imagine about things like that. There's plenty of room. But it is important to get this idea of the human as a spiritual being straight. Uh, someone already today has asked me if they could pick my brain. And I said, if you pick my brain, you'll get blood. And that's not what you wanted. You can pick my mind. And to pick my mind, you don't even have to open me up. Right? Now, the body is absolutely central to human identity. And it is a glorious thing. It is meant to glow. Do you ever think about why Adam and Eva didn't know they were naked? Now, you've been waiting for this answer to that question. <laughs> it's because they glowed. You ever try to see a light bulb when it's on? It's very difficult. They glowed with the power of God. Right. Now, after they separated from God, they didn't glow. And they recognized their vulnerability. And they were terribly troubled by it. And they did what we all try to do. Hide our vulnerability. God said, who told you you were naked? Interesting question. Right? Now then, after the power is turned off, then the word comes to Adam. You will earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. Sweat. So now you can preach a sermon and teach a lesson on the theology of sweat. Why do we say, I'm cool, baby? Why do you say that? Oh, I'm cool. Some people think cool is a gift of the spirit, I think. And actually, it is. <laughs> because if you're really cool, it's because you're not sweating it out, see. But if you have to go it in your own power, you're going to sweat. And ever since God said that, people have been trying to figure out a way to live by the sweat of someone else's brow. And they're still very busy. And clever people learn how to do that. Present economic catastrophe. A brilliant illustration of what that's like. So, in heaven we will work, but we won't sweat. Try that one on. We've already been drawn into some discussions here about heaven, and uh, that's absolutely natural, because heaven is the natural extension of eternal living now. It's a natural extension. That's why Paul says, death is already, you're already past death. You have died. That's pretty definitive, isn't it? And you may recall that in 2 Timothy 1.10, Paul talks about how Jesus Christ abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Abolished death. 
Now that ought to, you know, it takes you a while to get around there. But Jesus clearly indicated that those who keep his word will not experience death. They will never see death. That's in John 8, 51 and 53. I encourage you to look at it. Because that changes the whole picture of death from the human picture, where death is the kind of the ultimate curse. And fear of death governs human life. That's why when you turn on the news, what's the first thing that comes on? Unless there's something of colorful uh, but uh, painful sexual nature, it'll be who died. And if it wasn't who died, it's who almost died. <laughs> and it'll be a house fire or a mudslide or a car wreck or something of that sort. And you ask yourself, why in the world is that? I hope you ask yourself that. It's because the world is obsessed with death and destruction. They're full of fear. And that fear pulls their attention. And that's why violence is the mainstay of so much of our, uh, I don't know what to call it, call it entertainment or news or whatever it is. I'm not sure what it is. Stirring the pot of evil. So we want to have a view now of eternal living. We want to understand that the body is precious, that matter is precious. The body is meant to be spiritual in its own right because that's where we live our eternal life. Now our identity is tied to our body. In eternity I will still be the son of Mamie and Albert Willard. That's eternal in the sense of from here on. That's who I am. That's why it's so important. That's why there's a resurrection. It's, you know, kind of odd, you think. Well, you know, if God wanted the body, he could just create another one. But he doesn't do that for us. The continuity of life involves our body. And this body will forever live in the experience of the person who goes on forever. I will always be that person. And that's why it is so important for us to think about things like honoring our father and our mother. Which for, I would say, most people in my experience is an unhealed running sore in their lives. And it affects them so deeply. And as Paul pointed out, it's the first promise, first commandment with promise. A healthy life comes out of that. Uh, I wish I had time to talk about that at length in these sessions, but I, I just run on and on, and it seems like time is so short, and I don't get to cover so many things. But that's, that's huge. Honor your father and your mother. And then how hard that is in so many cases. And you have to be able to put that in the larger context of life to be able to do it. And so many people only come, become able to honor their father and mother when the point comes where they can pity them because of their age or their suffering or something of that sort. And that's so important for us to understand the body. The body is meant to be an exper a spiritual expression of the person. And it can be that now. We have to stop hiding in it, which is one of the main things we do with our body is hide. Adam and Eve have fig leaves. You know, they could have just learned to fake it, which is what most of us do with our bodies. And of course, little children are so delightful because they haven't learned how to do that. They can't hide their souls. 
They're just right out there. And Jesus said, you must repent and become like a little child or you can't enter the kingdom of God. That's because you have to get real to do that. Lay aside all of the pretenses. And our body is, uh, is meant to be redeemed. Now let's uh, uh, look on your outline a little bit there and you'll see uh, an interesting topic which we might talk about. And um, the topic is why am I here? Four great questions of life. Okay. Now the Bible begins at Genesis 1, not at Genesis 3. Okay. The first significant event in human history is not the fall. And the last one is not redemption as an act of God. The first significant event in human history is creation. This is where we learn why we are here. And so you want to, uh, we, can, we don't have to start with the light and dark and sun and the moon and all that, but th th those are good things. Uh, and you'll notice, I love the fact that at almost every point, and the evening and the morning was such and such day, it combines that with a statement, God looked at it and it was good. It was good. Creative goodness is the natural expression of love. Why does God create? Because he loves. He loves. And love is his nature. And the creation of goodness is the natural expression of love. And love creates what is good? What is good? Love is directed to what is If you love your begonia, you take care of it, don't you? Now, come on. Isn't that true? I'm, I've got to drag you through these very fundamental things. I mean, what is love? See? You love your begonia, you take care of it. You hate your begonia, you don't take care of it. You're careless about your begonia, it's in for a hard time. You love your dog, you take care of it. Actually, dogs seem to be able to love you a little bit. We have these interesting cases where dogs save people's lives. And we all love the old Lassie stories where Lassie has someone in trouble and Lassie rushes to the neighbor and and what's Lassie doing? Oh, Lassie is okay. So they go save, see? And uh, that's a wonderful thing to see that. Horses can do something of that too. Um, but that's not really what their life is centered around, that sort of thing. Personality is centered around love. The center of the universe is love. The great triune community, love. Now, if you're in rebellion against it, it's going to look very scary. And I think that's how you have to approach a lot of the things in the Bible, that if you just take them by themselves, you think, how could God do that? Right? This is really tough. And, and frankly, blocks many people from approaching God because they get the idea that God is really mean. So, you know, those of us who are trying to work our way into these things, we need to ask questions like, how mean does God have to be to run the universe? And it might be he doesn't have to be mean at all. Maybe he just has to be God. But given that, you can understand why people are scared of that. Right, and you, I mean, you even have this teaching in the scripture that was right up front in the minds of the covenant people that if you see God, you die. 
and people have died from less, right? Because God is overwhelming. And when he invaded human history by stages as recorded in the scripture, things really jump. You know, when he came down on Sinai, that mountain was just pulsing with so much energy it was jumping up and down, right? Power like that, you just don't mess with. So still he creates and he creates what's good. And he looks at it and says, that's real good. And then he said, well, let's make human beings. Time to make human beings. A little late in the day, but maybe that's for the best. So let's make human beings. In our likeness, what was that? In our likeness. How could we be like God? Well, he explains in the next, the verse, this is Genesis 1.26. And Genesis 1.26 and 1.28, they lay out why we're here. And um, it's only if we get this straight that we can begin to understand eternal living. We are by nature suited to eternal living. Let us make human beings in our likeness, and then the next phrase tells you what the likeness is. Let them have dominion. Now, if you don't like dominion, just say, let them be responsible, because that's what it's talking about. Let them be responsible. And it's very clear that the intent was that they would be responsible for life on earth. The first thing that we're responsible on that list is fish. <laughs> well, you know, this was before domestication. And also, the human beings apparently had powers that they did not have later. And uh, so a little part of the story is how God brought all the living things before Adam and he gave them names. Uh, and that doesn't mean he said, well, that one's Bill and that one's Charlie and that's number 320. Right. He wasn't labeling them but discerning their natures. That's important if you're going to have dominion and be responsible for elephants. Mm -hmm. Now they have to train us how to be responsible. But the idea was responsible for the earth. Then you go on through Genesis and you see that's what it... The garden that... Uh, was planted, I believe, was simply the earth. Right? Be responsible, okay? This is it, of a garden. That's the basic nature of the human being, is to be responsible for good. And that ties to love. To be responsible is to work for what is good, right? Now, in a fallen world, we turn the responsibility around and we see something bad and we say, who's responsible for this? <laughs> Get their name and address. We're going after them, okay? But that's, that's not the original deal. The original deal is being able to bring about what is good. Now let me fit one other word in there. Good, love, and will. Okay, good, love, and will. To understand will, you have to understand that 
it relates to desire in a certain way. And now this is going to be central to what we have to do here in the coming hours. Will contemplates alternatives. That's the nature of will. It contemplates alternatives. That is why we have the term deliberate. We deliberate and then we express that in a choice, and that's will. Now contrast that with desire. Desire does not deliberate. Desire says, I want that. And desire is essentially conflictual. And you will recall that in James, his little letter in the opening of chapter 4 of James, he says, where, comes, where did the wars and fightings come from? Where did they come from? And pleasure and desires. Read, read those verses. That's where wars and... Come. Why, do, why, does, why, is, why doesn't it come from will? Why does it come from will? Will contemplates, and will is not essentially conflictual. Now, one of the things that we most need to do for our topic in these hours is to pay attention to what the New Testament says about desire. And this is hard for us because translators generally do not know what to do with the word epithumia which is translated ordinarily, lust. And we think, wow, that doesn't involve me, right? And uh, it's that epithumia really means obsessive desire. And it's nice to break the word down if you have some Greek at your disposal and get the epi and the thumia. Uh, it's, it's obsessive desire. It's desire that won't leave you alone. Uh, it's desire that expresses itself as a thirst that won't go away. And you keep coming back to it. The opposite is what Jesus said, those who receive my word and drink of the water that I shall give to them shall never thirst again. They will never again be under the domination of obsessive desire. Why? Because they will live for what is good by their will. See, the will has the power to write desires off. And the process of spiritual formation is very largely a matter of bringing desire under the control of what is good. See, desire is not bad in itself. That's where the Buddhist and the Stoic goes wrong. They say, if you want to walk into good life, get rid of desires. Well, number one, you can't. You can only fake it. But number two, it wouldn't be good for you to be. A desire is essential. We, could, we would never survive infancy without desire. But if we're going to grow up, we have to master desire. You remember that time God, you know, in the early, early chapters of the Bible, he's so chatty. He's always going around chatting with people. You know? Comes into the garden, want to have a little chat. Where are you, Adam? Not, oh, I'm in the bushes. Well, that complicates things. But he doesn't give up. You remember Cain? Cain is depressed. And who comes to counsel him but God himself? And so now Cain, you've got problems here. You know, uh, sin is crouching at the door. It would like to have you, but you don't have to give in. You can do what's right. Come on, Cain. Okay. And as the story goes along there, one of the interesting things is to see is God kind of stops doing that after a while. 
And after a few generations, you have that curious little phrase, in his day, men began to call on the name of the Lord. God had distanced himself. No. And things are not going well on earth. And so some drastic measures were taken about that. And Noah starts over again. Noah found grace with God. That's a remarkable statement. He found favor with God. And so there's a kind of start over, you know, I don't, I don't know how to go into the details, but it's a fascinating story. As God is working with people differently now as they go along. But desire has to come under the direction of the will for what is good. See? And so be careful when you talk about what you love. Because very often it isn't love, it's just desire. I enjoy talking about these things with my students because if you talk at the level of relationships and so on, you, you realize there's some real problems with love. Right? Because often people say they love what they desire. They don't. I, I, I like to illustrate this by saying people love their chocolate, love, they say they love chocolate cake, but they don't, they want to eat it. Right? That's different. And you talk to young people about desire and love, and they know there's a big difference here. If you love something, you're prepared to act for what is good for that thing that you love. So let's understand then the difference. Now, will is crucial to our calling, which is to be responsible for the earth. And so uh, the will has to be corrected because the will is the executive center of the self. Now later on I want to talk about all of the different parts of the self. But I have to focus on the will because that's where the problem is. I say the will is primarily designed to trust God, to live in relationship to God. That takes care of what is good. That's why the temptation is so important. Because trusting God means you accept that what he says is right and good. And you're not misled by desires. See, the primary form of temptation is, if I don't do this, I'm going to miss out on something good. That's the primary form of temptation. And then growing in grace means you come to the point where you never think that thought. Because you know who is taking care of you. Right? Now, Eve, I'm sure Adam was right at her shoulder. I don't think he was over on the South 40 when this happened. Um, Eve looked at that fruit. And she saw that it was good to eat. Lust of the flesh. That it was pleasant to look at. Lust of the eyes. That it was Good to make one wise. Pride of life. See? Those are the three things. They show up again in Matthew 4 in the temptations of Jesus. Bread, notoriety, power. Right? See, now that's a constant lesson. These are the things, when you read the Bible, you don't worry about stuff that shows up once or twice. What's there all the time, you really want to pay attention to. <laughs> okay. And so when you get to John, John chapter 2, three things in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Okay. And that's all in the area of what will pull us away from what is good. And that's what we are designed 
to live for. And that requires that we be persons who live in connection with God. Long story that packs so much into it that needs to be unpacked, but basically that's it. 